The United States is not at war. The United States is war. Sora Han. No Wall They Can Build. A Guide to Borders and Migration Across North America. Episode 2. Defining Terms, The Aftermath, and The Travelers. Defining Terms. Absent any other qualifier, the border refers to the border between Mexico and the United States. For the purposes of this book, the U.S.-Canada border is less important than the two southern borders. That being said, the Canadian immigration system is distinct from that of the United States. I'll leave the analysis to those who have experience with it. See Undoing Border Imperialism by Harsha Walia, for example. The desert refers to the part of the border in the Sonoran Desert of southern Arizona, where I worked, mostly between Sasabe and Nogales. The construction Migrants and Refugees refers to people without American citizenship who crossed the border in order to live and work in the United States, with or without the authorization or documents required under American immigration regulations. I'll sometimes collapse this to migrants or travelers. I make no distinction between migrants crossing the border for economic reasons and refugees crossing the border to flee violence or persecution. In my experience, these are arbitrary categories, and most people's motivations are a combination of both. In many parts of the world, it's difficult to distinguish between poverty and violence or persecution in the first place. However, refugee does have a definition under both American and international law. Many of the people who cross the border fall within this definition, and the American government has a legal obligation to treat them accordingly. The American government rarely meets this obligation and has a vested interest in defining all such people as migrants. Because of this, I believe it's important to bring the term refugee into wider use in the United States to refer to people who cross the border, despite the fact that it doesn't necessarily describe every person. There are, of course, migrants and refugees from all over the world who enter the United States by other means than crossing the border, but that is outside the scope of this work. Irregular migration refers to migration that takes place outside the regulatory norms of the sending, transit, or receiving countries. Undocumented people refers to people who are inside of the United States or Mexico without the authorization or documents required under the American or Mexican immigration regulations. Obviously, these people possess documents, but no alternative phrase to describe the situation is in common use. Solidarity worker refers to people, such as myself, for seven years who ascribe to radical politics, and whose political activity is oriented around the needs of others, in this case of migrants and refugees. This is not a common construction, but for many reasons I dislike the term activist and strongly dislike the less common alternative, ally. Neither term accurately describes our role on the border or in society at large. The nearly perfect phrase, desert aid worker, is a neologism in constant use inside of No More Deaths, but unknown anywhere else. I aim to convey its spirit and broaden its scope, while still highlighting the fact that people such as myself are also subject to the pressures of capitalism. I will sometimes use American as an adjective to refer to things pertaining to the United States. This usage is, of course, both geographically inaccurate and linguistically imperialist. However, as no alternative adjective, comparable to the Spanish Estado Unidense, exists in standard American English, there is sometimes no way to avoid it. The Aftermath It's best to tell the hardest truth first. Like the rest of the Western Hemisphere, the land that is currently called the United States of America, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, was stolen from its original inhabitants by European colonists through a well-documented orgy of bloodshed, treachery, and genocide of proportions so epic that they are arguably unprecedented in the thousands of often gruesome years of human history preceding them. 
and unsurpassed in the hardly tranquil ones that followed. In progress for over 500 years, this monstrous crime has never been atoned for in any meaningful way. It is still being perpetrated to this day. Everybody knows this, but nobody really likes to think too much about what it means. What it means is this. Unless you're honest enough to admit that you think that might makes right as long as you're on the winning side, you have to acknowledge that the federal, local, and state governments of these countries, including all their agencies such as Border Patrol, Customs and Border Protection, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, are illegitimate institutions with no claim to legitimate authority over the territory they currently govern. It's important to start by framing the matter thus. Who are these people that claim to have jurisdiction over native land? What right do they have to be telling anybody where to go and when? If anyone has a right to decide who can and cannot pass through North America, it's the people whose ancestors have inhabited that land since time immemorial, not the descendants or institutions of the ones who colonized it. Most so-called illegal immigrants have a more defensible claim to the continent they're traversing than most of the hypocrites who condemn and pursue them. Furthermore, much of the wealth of the United States, like that of much of the rest of the Western Hemisphere, was accumulated through the greatest mass kidnapping and wage theft ever perpetrated in human history, the Atlantic slave trade, and the southern plantation system. Once again, this monstrous crime has never been atoned for, and its impacts continue to be felt to this day. Again, who is to say that these latest immigrants don't also deserve a piece of the pie? How many of the upstanding citizens clamoring for a wall have slave owners in their family trees? Not all, but plenty. I do. Are they willing to board airplanes and deport themselves back to Europe without delay? At least the people now crossing the border to better their station in life are willing to do the work themselves, rather than enslaving others to do it for them. For over 500 years, the central narrative of the Western Hemisphere has been the ongoing story of slavery and colonization the theft of lives, labor, and land. The aftermath of this process shapes everything that has followed. It's impossible to understand North America without putting this front and center. There is a counter-narrative, too, just as old and strong, made up of countless stories of courage and resistance. I'll be telling some of those here as well. One day, my colleague and I drove way out into the middle of nowhere to drop water in the desert. Four days later, it was time to check on it. On our way out to the spot, we saw a man sitting by the side of the little dirt road. He had a ripped up piece of blanket tied around one knee. How are you doing? I asked him. Badly, he answered. Look at this. He pulled up his pant leg to reveal a black, swollen, thoroughly broken ankle. That's bad, I said. You need to go to the hospital. Yeah, he said. Look at this. He pulled his shirt aside. Oh, shit! My colleague and I shouted in unison, unprofessionally. He had a large open chest wound, bloody, half scabbed over and oozing pus. You need to go to the hospital right now. What happened? Four nights ago, I was walking with three other men through those mountains over there. I took a blind fall 10 or 12 feet over a cliff. I broke my ankle and sliced my chest open on a rock. They carried me down from there all through the night. In the morning we saw you drive by, but we were still too high. We couldn't get to the road in time. When we got here, they left and said they were going to find help. I haven't seen them or anybody else since. You've been here four days. It had been well over 100 degrees every day. Have you had any food or water? Food, no. A couple times a day I crawled over to that pond. I didn't want to get very far from the road in case somebody drove by. There was a dried up cattle pond a hundred yards from the road, at best an inch deep, mostly manure and sludge. There were about a dozen sets of drag marks where he had crawled between the pond and the road. We drove him to the ambulance. He was remarkably stoic about everything. I asked him if the bumpy road was hurting his ankle. No. Your chest? No. You didn't get sick from the bad water? I was sure that he would have died if he had. No. Just call my wife in Dallas and tell her I'm alive. I did. 
The ambulance took him to the hospital and I never heard from him again. Empacó un par de camisas, un sombrero Su vocación de aventurero, seis consejos, siete fotos, mil recuerdos The travelers. The vast majority of the people who cross the border are citizens of either Mexico, most commonly from the southern states of Oaxaca, Guerrero, Michoacán, Veracruz, and Chiapas, or the northern triangle of Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. There are some exceptions. While working in the desert, I met a few people from Belize, Nicaragua, and Peru, and more than a few from Ecuador but far more from Mexico and the Northern Triangle. This is why I refer to the Northern Triangle rather than Central America. Far fewer Nicaraguans, Belizeans, Costa Ricans, and Panamanians go to the United States for work, and far fewer of those who do so cross the border in order to get there. What drives citizens of these countries across the border? Most people in the world, all other things being equal, prefer to live wherever their immediate families live. However, millions of people are pushed and pulled between Mexico, the Northern Triangle, and the United States by a combination of powerful forces. Most parts of this cycle cannot solely be defined as a push or pull factor, but are both at once. Taken individually, every story is different. Taken as a whole, nearly all the stories I've heard share one of three common themes. Over and over, I met people who said they were crossing the border because they had been deported and were returning home, because they were fleeing violence and poverty to the South, or because they could make a better living in the North. Often it was a combination of all three. The particulars vary endlessly, but the pattern holds. To state the obvious, migrants and refugees are possessed of agency and free will, like everyone else. Generally speaking, people choose to do whatever they think is best from the options they have available. So the first of the factors pulling people north and pushing people south is that the American government deports hundreds of thousands of people to Mexico and the Northern Triangle every year. Many of the deportees' immediate families live in the United States, and many deportees have homes, jobs, and cars here as well. Regardless of citizenship, these are not people who live in Mexico or the Northern Triangle. They are people who live in the United States. Many have lived here for years and even decades. One of the most common reasons to cross the border into the United States is simply to return home. Another factor that pushes people north is the widespread instability and violence throughout much of Mexico and the Northern Triangle. Many people cross the border primarily to get away from this. I'll explore what this looks like and why this is the case in the next section. The last of the three primary factors that push and pull people north over the border is the wage and cost of living differential between the United States. Mexico, and the Northern Triangle, what Greek economist Argiri Emanuel refers to as unequal exchange. In absolute terms, the cost of living is somewhat lower in Mexico than in the United States, and lower still in the Northern Triangle. However, wages for comparable work are, to a disproportionate degree, much lower in Mexico than in the United States, and very much lower still in the Northern Triangle. For example, as of 2016, the federal minimum wage in the United States is $7.25 an hour, with much unskilled to semi-skilled labor paying around $10 to $15 an hour. In Guatemala, a typical wage for the same labor could be anywhere from $0.35 cents to $1.50 an hour, with many people working precariously in the informal sector and guaranteed no earnings at all. This holds true across the wage spectrum. Regardless of whether we are talking about bricklaying or open-heart surgery, the value of an hour's work will be much lower if performed in Mexico or elsewhere in the global south than if the same labor were performed in the United States or elsewhere in the global north, and lower still if performed in the Northern Triangle or elsewhere in the Deep South. Furthermore, most imported goods are at least as expensive in Mexico as in the United States, and usually more so. They are usually more expensive still in the Northern Triangle. This goes for nearly anything exported from the United States or elsewhere in the Global North and imported into Mexico, the Northern Triangle, or elsewhere in the Global South. Food, construction materials, automobiles, electronics, books, medicines, and so on. A used car, for instance, will invariably increase in value when it crosses the border from the United States to Mexico, and again when it leaves Mexico and enters Guatemala. 
Many Mexicans from border cities will buy groceries at the Safeway on the American side, if they have the papers to do so. Processed food is usually cheaper there. Textbooks can cost twice as much in Guatemala as in the United States. Many Americans who have traveled across the border will have the impression that things are cheaper in Mexico. Dental care is the most well-known example. Not exactly. Services, such as dental care, are cheaper in Mexico. This makes sense. The cost of services reflects the value of wages. Goods are likely to be comparably priced if they are manufactured in Mexico, and more expensive if they are not. What's more, this applies to most goods manufactured in other parts of the Global South and exported to Mexico or the Northern Triangle. A pair of jeans made in Bangladesh or a cell phone made in China will not be any cheaper at a Walmart in Tuxtla Gutierrez or Tegucigalpa than a Walmart in Tulsa and may well be more expensive. So, while the absolute cost of living is lower in Mexico than in the United States and lower still in the Northern Triangle, the cost of living relative to wages is higher in Mexico and higher still in the Northern Triangle. Picture it this way. A pair of eyeglasses that costs $120 represents eight hours of labor to a waitress in the United States making $15 an hour. The same pair of glasses might cost $135 in Guatemala and might represent 22 days of labor to a worker performing the same work at 75 cents an hour. This is as if the pair of glasses cost $2,640 to the waitress in the United States. In short, what this means is that life is generally easier in the United States, harder in Mexico, and harder still in the Northern Triangle. This is the condition that the border enforces. Lower prices and higher wages to the north, higher prices and lower wages to the south. Millions of people can see this clearly and act accordingly. Now let's get into why this is the case. One day we met three Central Americans. The Salvadoran had been traveling with his niece. He had promised his brother that he would take care of her. He was carrying her bag when Border Patrol split up the group. He was separated from her in the chaos and Border Patrol took her away. He escaped with the two Hondurans. The younger one kept telling him that he had done all he could do. They had run out of food and water and the older Honduran had a badly twisted knee. They had been utterly lost for four days and nights. The Salvadoran had a cell phone that did not have service in the U.S. It was full of pictures of places they had been to and things they had seen. Look at this mountain, he said. We crossed it. It was so beautiful. We thought for sure that we were going to die. While they were recuperating, he asked me how much it cost to fill up the tank of our truck. I told him usually about 75 bucks. 75 dollars? Yeah. I answered, assuming he thought that that was very expensive. How much would it cost in El Salvador? A hundred and fifty? Maybe two hundred? Two hundred? Dollars? Jesus, how much do you make an hour there? I was making eight dollars a day working construction when I left. I got a pencil and we did some math. After lengthy deliberations, we determined that... 1. 150 to 200 dollars a tank represents about 20 days of labor at 8 dollars a day. 2. I usually make 15 dollars an hour, which is about 120 dollars a day. 3. This meant that an 175 dollar tank of gas for the Salvadoran was as difficult to afford as a 2500 dollar tank of gas would be for me. That's a problem, I said. It's a very serious problem, he agreed. They tied our currency to the dollar and everything got incredibly expensive. It's just impossible to live there right now. A little later, he found a laminated picture of a young girl in our kitchen. Who is this? He asked me. Um, she was abandoned by our guide. One of our volunteers found her body in the desert last winter. She was only 14. Where was she from? El Salvador. He looked like he was going to cry. 
How old is your niece? Fourteen. The younger Honduran put his arm around the Salvadoran shoulders. She was having a hard time keeping up. I thought I was going to have to carry her. It was dark. There were lights and screaming. Everybody was running every which way. She fell down and they grabbed her. I saw them carry her away. I ran. I don't know if she's safe. I don't know if I did the right thing. I'm sorry, I told him. We ate together and they left as the moon was coming up. The older Honduran had wrapped up his knee and taken a lot of painkillers. No matter what happens, the Salvadoran said, we're not going to leave him. They're not going to get us. We're going to make it. He called us a week later from his cousin's house in Utah. They had all made it out of the desert. You've just listened to episode two of No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America, published by the Crankthink X Workers Collective. Stay tuned next week for episode three, The South, part one, Mexico. This audiobook is a production of the X Worker Podcast Collective. You can check us out at crimethink.com slash podcast. To order a print copy of the book, read a free PDF version online, check out the poster that accompanies the book, or learn more about the anarchist struggle for a world without borders, visit crimethink.com slash borders. To learn more about No More Deaths, and solidarity work in the desert along the U.S.-Mexico border, visit nomoredeaths.org.